You know, I've been interested in masculinity for a long time. Uh, the way we think about what is masculine, we live in a relatively sort of macho culture. The whole thing about men never expressing vulnerability, weakness, neediness, which just doesn't seem real. Men were supposed to pretend that they didn't care about how they looked, and of course, you know, all the toupees and, and uh, hair transplants and other things that men have done, <clears throat> it's obvious that men do care. So the more I examined the whole thing, the more I thought, you know, we have this sort of exaggerated, rather rigid definition of masculinity. And going further, I realized, you know, that starting like back in the 70s with feminism, people had started to redefine what being feminine means. So I wound up really thinking it was kind of important, not just for me personally, but also because I don't think that we can redefine what is feminine without redefining what is masculine. And when I started, oh, I don't know, five or six years ago, photographing myself in different performance modes and making a series of, of portraits, first based on the archetypes of Carl Jung, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to choose like a certain number of male archetypes from our type of society? Photograph them, you know, not just as the way I see them, or the way I think that we collectively see them, but also to a certain extent the way they are. You know, and I wanted to capture a wide range of the kinds of roles that men fill. The creative, whether it's um, a rock musician or a visual artist, or maybe even um, a fashion designer. <clears throat> These types who generate a lot of sort of license for themselves to be soft, flamboyant types of men because, in theory at least, they're very good at something. The money man for whom the bag of money, the bank account, is the symbol of power. And then the caregiver, because, you know, we think of caregivers as women, but just as women might be CEOs or financial power types or politicians, um, men might be, uh, you know, have the bedside manner and, be good at taking care of people and so forth. The bureaucrat is another type of man who, you know, he's kind of like the organization man who just finds his way, nods his head yes, and does what he's supposed to do and survives that way. An enormous number of people have a job or a daily routine, and that daily routine or job is often kind of dehumanizing. It seems like the bureaucrat is the ultimate dehumanized, and so the cubicle and you know, it's not a private space, it's not an office, and it's not a den, and it's not a barn, and it's not a cell. It's open, you know, it's not private. I guess, you know, the idea of the interactions that probably everybody has had, I know I've had a number of you sit in these cubicles, and, you know, in between being asked questions or doing whatever business you have to do with the person who inhabits the cubicle, you sort of look at their family pictures or what, if, what they've posted. So it's really an interesting... Uh, exercise to gather together different things to use for the, um, for the cubicle um, <clears throat> in a way to try to sort of like get at some of the humanity that this hypothetical type of person might uh, have in their cubicle. Okay, you're going to need a third reference. No, that means no. It's not safe to assume that the processor speaks Spanish. Driver's license, okay. No moving, not a meeting, no. Okay, very good. All you need to get are... You need the zip codes and telephone numbers of past employees. And you need a third reference. Okay. So, like, I gotta bring that stuff back. You have two days to bring it back. You're pretty two days? Shape. Like right. two days from today or from tomorrow? Tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Two business days. Okay. Thank you. What Thank was you your name? Much. You don't need to know my name.